Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's webinar. Um, we can see that there are still a few people logging in as we speak, so we'll just give it another one or two minutes and then we'll get the webinar underway. Okay, I think we'll make a start there. Um, welcome to today's Fisher ITS webinar. My name is Ben Eagley and I'll be just making a brief introduction to today's proceedings. Uh, today we are going to be discussing an introduction to micro focus audit defence. Uh, we will be laying out uh, some background information to this vendor and then going through what we see as uh, the most common uh, process that micro focus take whilst auditing and how you can defend against that process. Um, micro focus, as many of you will know, is a particularly large and complex vendor, a real patchwork of different products. So it would be impossible to cover everything in detail uh, in just the one hour. So that's why we've focused on this as um, an introductory webinar where, where we will look, look across the vendor in broad terms. Um, any specific questions you may have relating to microfocus licensing or auditing in general, uh, please drop them into the question bar, uh, which you should have on your display. And we will endeavor to answer those both as we go through and then uh, in, some, uh, in some time that we have dedicated to questions at the end. Okay, uh, I'll just give a quick introduction to who Fisher ITS are. Uh, Poppy, if you can move the slide forward one, please. Thank you. So Fisher ITS are a UK-based software asset management uh, consultancy firm. We specialize in audit, defense, and software license optimize, optimization um, across all of the major vendors. Um, that includes Microsoft, SAP, IBM, and Oracle, um, plus the likes of uh, Microfocused, as discussed, Quest, Adobe, VMware, and we have an experienced team of software licensing consultants uh, within the business and um, there's uh, not very many vendors which we haven't covered so far during our years in operation. Uh, the company is founded and primarily made up of um, ex-auditors from either the, uh, the big four accountancy firms or the vendors themselves. So we very much have a poacher turned gamekeeper approach uh, to software license advisory services and as well as uh, the projects that we offer in terms of audit defense or license optimization. We work with um, numerous blue chip firms in UK, Europe and North America uh, to provide ongoing managed services aimed at reducing compliance risk, improving IT business processes and ultimately reducing uh, unnecessary spend and wasted spend on software licenses. Okay, uh, if we just move ahead one slide, I'll introduce today's speakers before they take over from me. So leading today's session will be Poppy Gack. Poppy is a senior licensing consultant at Fisher ITS, um, very experienced background um, across many of the vendors and uh, has recently been providing a lot of our uh, content and, and work around microfocus as a vendor. And supporting Poppy today uh, on today's webinar will be Hans Merkins. Uh, Hans is a senior licensing consulting manager within Fisher ITS, 
again, specializes across many vendors, uh, Microsoft, SAP, Microsoft, Quest, for example. Um, I will now hand over to Poppy, uh, who will get the presentation underway. Uh, please feel free to make use of the chat uh, session, uh, chat option that you have here. We would be keen to hear um, why you have joined this session, what you're what your interest in microfocus is. Is it particularly audit defense? Is it license optimization? Is it just for um, general knowledge gathering on, on this vendor? And as mentioned, we'll be monitoring the questions throughout. Okay, uh, Poppy, over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Ben. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this webinar um, for an introduction to microfocus audit defense. Um, as Ben mentioned in the webinar today, uh, we will be discussing the, the main things to look for in your estate um, and the common concerns when it comes to microfocus licensing. Uh, we will explain how microfocus will audit you and the process that they take. Um, but firstly, we wanted to provide a quick introduction um, to microfocus as a software publisher um, and perhaps explain why this this tier two publisher shouldn't be overlooked um, and why it should instead be a high priority for you to focus on. So whilst Microfocus are based in Newbury in the UK, they do have 12,000 employees, 40,000 customers and over 7,500 partners um, and that's across 48 countries worldwide. Um, as you can see from the images on the right hand side, their product landing page shows over 250 products. Uh, when we first took this uh, screenshot of the of the landing page um, a couple of weeks ago, there were 259 results. Now there are 267. So obviously, Microfocus are, are definitely growing the number of enterprise offerings available to their customers. Um, this kind of large amount of products that they have um, is largely due to the number of acquisitions that Microfocus have made in the last 20 plus years. Uh, as you can see here, we have shared a number of the, the kind of more recent um, and more notable acquisitions. Um, for example, in, in 2014, Microfocus completed the acquisition of the Attachmate Group. Um, this included Attachmate, uh, NetIQ and Novell, to name a few. That was followed by the 2016 acquisition of Serena Software and then the merge with HPE's software business in 2017. So whilst the acquisitions um, that I've just mentioned only date back to the last six or seven years, uh, Microfocus have actually been involved in M&A activity since 1998. Um, that was when they acquired Intersolve and the merged business became Marant. Uh, so this just highlights the complexity in Microfocus licensing um, and the difficulties that customers face when working towards compliance um, since there are, are so many publisher names to look out for, um, particularly when software inventory tools may not be up to date with all of the changes. So in addition to the large and expanding product portfolio, um, there has also been recent discussion in the industry regarding Microfocus um, and their relationship with customers. So a recent poll um, at the end of last year by the ITAM review highlighted Microfocus as the least helpful software publisher, uh, beating Oracle, IBM and Quest to the post. Um, I'm sure this position is, is no surprise to a lot of you, um, though I would like to highlight that following the results of that poll, Microfocus themselves released a blog post stating that even greater empathy was needed last year and then went on to explain how they stopped new audit activity uh, and allegedly relaxed their audit processes um, in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, it's certainly interesting to me um, when I found out that the statement from Microfocus was released less than a week after the results of the, the ITAM review poll were, were announced. So given their status of least helpful publisher, um, it's perhaps unsurprising then that Microfocus is also recognised as one of these software publishers uh, that doesn't shy away from bringing court proceedings against their customers um, when the arguments cannot be settled otherwise. One such example uh, of this is the recent case of Express Scripts, um, where there were two kind of two main issues at hand. 
Uh, firstly, whether users who could launch but not use software required a license. Um, in this case, the products were installed on Citrix servers and over 35,000 users had access. The term authorized user means um, if it's not defined in a contract. Um, this was the license metric on the purchase order but the end user license agreement that was accepted along with the installation and deployment of the product made no, no reference to um, and didn't include a description of an authorized user metric. Um, so I won't dive into the details um, now as there's already quite a lot of coverage online, um, but in this case, the customer won um, and Microfocus were denied a new trial. Um, I know that many customers will typically shy away from, from going to court, uh, but, but one thing to take from this finding in the customer's favour uh, is that the, the very real threat of legal action doesn't necessarily have to be a reason to give up on all of your arguments with Microfocus. So if you would, however, prefer to stay away from the courts, uh, there are some things that you can look out for um, to avoid having these arguments with Microfocus in the first place. Uh, we will go through each of the, the common pitfalls um, and areas of concern for Microfocus non-compliance um, but the central themes that we see uh, relate to access, usage and contract rights. So firstly, um, as we've already mentioned, it's common for customers to install desktop uh, tools and servers. Um, in this case, Microfocus will argue that a license is required for all users with access to the software. Um, there are particular problems here with terminal emulation software. Um, that may have at some point been included in, in standard builds um, and, and deployed widely across the organization with little or no thought of licensing impact. Um, in the Express Scripts case that um, I mentioned just a minute ago, Microfocus argued that all uh, Roomba and OnWeb users required a license, even if they couldn't actually access um, or use information from the connected mainframes. Uh, the customer in this case did argue that the interpretation was commercially unreasonable since no rational customer would purchase a software license so that its user, users could see a login screen. Um, certainly a, a justified reasoning to me, um, but this is generally a, a long-standing argument um, that many software publishers have with their customers um, and there, there has been little clarity on the matter. Um, even with the, the court authority generally ruling in, in the customer's favor in the Express Scripts case. Uh, so as a result, um, this is still an area of concern for many customers, um, still something that will be explored further. Maybe if, if we go back just a second. Um, yeah. The interesting question came in uh, the other day, not, not here, but outside, where it was even more than that, where if you have the same user using your license on a laptop, for example, attach made uh, tools like that, and have it installed on Citrix, but the same user keep using it, it is still possible with the right interpretation of the licensing rules that that user would require more than one licenses just because he can access it on mobile machines and everything. It's not, a, it's definitely debatable, but definitely any time it is not clear cut where who has access or where are they accessing it, it's worthwhile to investigate. Have a carry on, Poppy. Yep, yeah, sure. And, and, and just to add to that, thank you, Hans, just to add, um, obviously, um, I think you know the, these things are open to interpretation, um, and if you've you know if you've got restrictions um, on on the user that's that's accessing that, then obviously that that certainly helps. But um, yeah, it's definitely something that we're still seeing um, come up nowadays. So it, it's still um, something that should be explored. Um, so next, uh, an area that is sometimes overlooked is product specific use rights. Um, so these can include rights governing uh, virtualization and third party usage, uh, but perhaps more commonly includes uh, geographical limitations. With regards to uh, geographical limitations, one of the biggest concerns that our customers have um, relates to geographical use rights and the site area global discussion. Um, an example of this problem that we've uh, seen um, in, in the real world is uh, we've worked with 
uh, several clients who have had a global office uh, and then additional offices in the same city uh, and obviously this setup would not be covered by a site license um, since the offices are located at, at more than one site um, or physical address uh, so in this case um, use rights can be limited to to site as I just mentioned so you know a, a building number and a street address um, are taken into consideration um, it can also be limited to area, um, which effectively is, is interpreted as the region or, or the continent, so EMEA, APAC in the Americas um, and so on. Um, all customers can be allowed to deploy and use the software globally with, with no geographical restriction. Uh, you should always um, read and understand your own contracts as well as the standard license agreements um, and follow the order of precedence given to avoid non-compliance. Um, typically, your contract will take precedence over any standard document from Microfocus, um, so you should understand and apply those, term, those terms first. Um, and in, in addition to the use rights and restrictions, um, Microfocus are known to be quite aggressive auditors. Um, their scripts can often pick up what we'd call left behind software. So a single installation, um, source code, or in some cases, uninstalled applications. Uh, Microfocus will typically argue that these will require a license, um, so it, it's generally recommended to uh, follow SAM best practices and, and be fully aware of the software that you have um, and had installed um, and to regularly clean up your estate. So the third area of concern uh, is the relatively new um, all or nothing support policy. Um, now I've included a copy of the relevant section of the support agreement here on the screen. Um, the key paragraph is, is the middle one um, that states that unless otherwise agreed, uh, the customer must renew support for all licenses of the software that it has copied, used, installed or otherwise exploited. Um, this policy is referenced in most recent agreements um, and it, it came into force in January 2018. Um, so obviously it may not be relevant if your contract um, is, is older than this and you haven't signed any new support agreements um, or uh, if a newer contract or agreement governs the audit. However, um, you would need to make sure that support has been purchased on the full license set um, in order to be compliant with your support terms. So now that we've um, discussed a few of the common pitfalls to Microfocus licensing, um, take a look at the likelihood of Microfocus auditing and the process that they'll follow. So as you can see in the chart on the right, uh, Microfocus revenue dropped in 2020, uh, which is a, a likely impact of the pandemic. Um, and according to the annual report that Microfocus released uh, a couple of months ago in, in February, um, the business generated an operating loss of over 2,500 million. Um, so we should expect to see an increase in audits this year as Microfocus work to gain back the revenue um, that they lost uh, during the pandemic. Um, also in the annual report, uh, Microfocus provided an update on their three-year ambition, um, which set out to reduce the revenue decline to zero. Um, and also generate in excess of 700 million of annual free cash flow. Um, this further emphasizing that audits generating revenue will be a significant focus um, in the coming years. So in terms of the types of audit that Microfocus carry out, um, historically, a lot of Microfocus audits were performed by third party auditors. Uh, such as the big four, um, though there have also been audits performed um, under a, a reseller margin or a referral fee for non-compliance. Um, Microfocus also has an internal team of license verification, compliance managers and technical license specialists uh, that carry out direct audits and license reviews. Um, so that's a, an, an internal team. Um, I personally have seen an increase in the direct audits uh, and I'm aware that the internal compliance team has been growing um, over the last few years. Uh, but in terms of, of which approach um, is best um, and which should be preferred from, from the customer side, um, there are kind of several factors to, to take into consideration. Um, so in the past, I have seen audits uh, be killed off before they've even started. 
um, as customers have proved that there's no right for a, a third party auditor um, and MicroFocus have at the time lacked the capacity to take on the audit themselves. Um, but that's not to say that there is a problem with third party audits. Um, when third party auditors are involved, uh, particularly with the big four, um, there's supposedly a level of independence from the vendor um, that is debatable um, to some extent since MicroFocus in this case are the ones paying the audit firm. Um, but also the third party can remove some of the confrontational aspects of the audit um, as they are, act as kind of middleman um, in the process. Uh, and it's also possible um, in, in some cases that the third party auditors might have a, a greater level of knowledge to share um, and arguably uh, a greater level of structure and process in place. The general structure of the audit process can typically be carried out um, over to internal reviews for other vendors too, so that there are some benefits of, of having a third party led audit. So what about the audit process that MicroFocus will take? Um, so this is the, the kind of standard approach um, that they'll have when it comes to auditing their customers. Uh, we'll go through each step in detail, uh, but in general, um, Microfocus will begin by profiling their customers to determine who will be a good target for audit. Um, they will then notify the customer, um, go through the audit kickoff um, where this, the scope of the audit will be discussed. Um, then it's the data collection phase, creating the ELP and providing it to the customer for verification. Um, and finally, it's the, the settlement discussions and, and the close of the audit. So to start, we have the profiling and audit target selection phase. Um, here, MicroFocus will nominate potential targets for audit based on a number of risk indicators. Um, some examples of these are the customer's purchase level with MicroFocus, um, levels of organizational change, such as uh, M&A activity, um, having a purchase pattern that doesn't reflect company growth, um, but also a SAM maturity um, intelligence that's been gathered from the account team. So obviously um, your kind of micro focus sales rep will, will be working with the compliance managers um, to, to kind of pick and, and target audit, um, customers for audit. Uh, micro focus are also likely to ramp up their audit activity when they merge or acquire a new company. Um, um, attach mate acquisition and the HP merger um, when MicroFocus ramped up the number of audits that they performed um, as they expanded their, their product portfolio and their customer base. Um, so as always, um, the best way to kind of deal with a potential audit is to be proactive rather than reactive um, and to be aware of your license position well in advance. So once you have been targeted um, and notified for audit, Microfocus will likely use standard agreements to prove their right to audit. Um, and more recently, we've also noticed them um, referencing a number of their dedicated web pages um, that relate to their audit policy um, in order to prove their right to audit. Uh, you should always review the audit clause in your own contract, um, as this will take precedence over the standard uh, EULA or, or policies that Microfocus will reference. Um, if you have done a, a deep dive contract review um, and you cannot find an audit clause, the burden will be on, on MicroFocus to prove their right to audit. Um, and if they don't have uh, accurate and up-to-date records of your contracts and your entitlement, they will need to, to prove that you've accepted any standard um, either click-through terms or, or agreements um, before they bind those to you. So in terms of the uh, audit clause, there are a few things um, to look out for. So um, as I've already mentioned, whether third party auditors are allowed. Um, so at the beginning of this uh, standard audit clause, um, you can see license or, or an auditor is mentioned, um, but in some older contracts, there's, there's no reference to any third party auditors. So Obviously, in that case, if microfocus are using a third party, you would be able to, to kick them out of the audit. Um, in this clause, there's a relatively standard record keeping section, um, but you will also notice in the, the 
paragraph um, B, there's seven days for the customer to fulfill the data request. Um, now compared to, to some vendors, this is quite a small time frame. Um, for example, uh, Oracle's standard audit clause um, gives customers 45 days written notice um, to respond to the audit. And, and for many software publishers, the terminology used is, is a more relaxed upon reasonable notice um, rather than, than a fixed number. Uh, the audit clause also includes a, a somewhat standard section referring to access to records um, and or computers. Uh, and additionally, uh, what happens if non-compliance is found? Um, and in the middle of the, the final paragraph there, you can see that um, in the case of microfocus, um, it's list price um, and, and back maintenance that will be owed. So and moving on. Audit clause is, is quite interesting, actually, because I think it's one of the few vendors where you can almost noticeably see the audit clause grow every year. Because yeah. I know most vendors would only take about one paragraph of this to describe their audits. I think for Microfocus, if I close the audit clause and a year later check, it usually doubles in size. So it follows that, that law of uh, exponential growth. And especially yeah. with that web page they've included, which have page after page of extra information on their process, everything. But just keep in mind that this is just their way to try and force customers down. Most people have not explicitly agreed to this, especially if you have an older contract and so on. They might claim you do, but still, as Poppy said, keep in mind that uh, check your contract and make sure that they prove it. One recentish case that I can uh, bring up there is uh, where Microfocus and their auditors, our client asked, hey, can you send us the contract which you want to audit? And the auditor response was basically, oh, let's first start, and once we find the software, we'll prove that we can audit you, which is obviously a joke, because that's not a good reason to audit someone. So definitely, you know, make them prove that they can audit you, make them show that audit clause, where it's referenced, where your signature is, make sure it's someone high enough in the firm who can who sign that off, and, uh, and don't start until they've uh, gone there. Or if you do, be very harsh on the restrictions on what Microfocus can and cannot do. Carry on. Yeah, thank you, Hans. Uh, so moving on to the, the scoping um, and, and audit initiation phase. Uh, so this determines how the audit will be conducted. Um, and you should make sure that the scope of the audit is, is very clear before you move any further. Um, so you should ensure that the agreed scope um, only includes software licenses under your direct ownership um, and under your direct management. Uh, you shouldn't include subsidiaries or overseas entities um, unless they are covered by the same license agreement that is owned uh, and managed by you. Um, furthermore, during the audit initiation, you should request an NDA to restrict the use of audit data um, from any other purposes. Uh, but also to add controls to the process um, that will even the playing field between you and Microfocus. Uh, finally, um, it's important that you ask for a reasonable timeline um, and make it clear if you're unable to comply with the timeline that's initially given um, in the audit kickoff. Uh, you're not you're not bound to complete an audit within a set time frame necessarily. So. If you can't stick to the time frame that Microfocus have originally provided, um, ask for an extension if, if you need one. Um, so before I move on to the data collection phase, um, I think we had a pre-submitted question uh, regarding the products that Microfocus usually audit. Um, so in terms of, of the products that are typically in scope um, of the audits that we work on, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, since the acquisitions, uh, we, we definitely see um, audits ramp up. Um, so we've seen attachment products like Reflection um, and Extra. Uh, we've seen legacy Novell products like um, Identity and Access Manager, uh, as well as HP's uh, Quality Center and, and ArcSight um, in audit scope as well. So this is obviously on top of the kind of legacy COBOL um, oh, and, and Rumba uh, mainframe software as well. Um, uh, interestingly, yeah. Microfocus Sorry, Hans, did you just think to... No, I, just, I was going to say, and, you know, the, the basic of microfocus is whatever they can find as well. 
So what they yeah. will often do is, is go after one product if they can find even one contract that is not a clause and then just ask you, hey, scan everything and we'll tell you what we audit. So whatever they can find, that they can find some legal affiliation with as part of their product groups, they will audit you if they can. Yeah, uh, and just to add to that, um, I worked on an, an audit um, a while ago now uh, where the customer had pushed back um, on the product scope, um, which then led to Microfocus um, investigating further um, and, and finding more products in use. Um, so obviously that's that's something to be careful about. Um, but also uh, Microfocus released a statement in their recent um, annual report that last year's performance in application delivery management, so the likes of ALM Quality Center um, and Load Runner, um, and also IT operations management um, was below expectations, uh, which could suggest that, that these products may be a focus for, for upcoming audits. Um, so obviously that's not to say that any other products that we haven't mentioned will definitely not be in scope, um, but those are just a few of the, the most common that we've seen. So moving on to the next phase, um, there are three kind of main points um, to remember during the, the data collection stage. Um, that's to control, to understand and to be certain of the data that you're providing to the auditor. Um, to successfully control this phase, you should make sure that there's one single point of contact um, overseeing the data collection. Uh, this is essentially so that your, your techies don't give away um, more data than necessary. Uh, where you can, um, you should use internal tools that are already in place um, and avoid using any um, intrusive scripts that Microfocus or the auditor have provided to you. Um, and also to make sure that you understand the, the rationale behind each data request. Um, and, and don't be afraid to ask questions to understand the purpose of the data request and, and what the auditor will use um, each kind of request response for. Uh, finally, um, be extra careful with what you declare um, and what data you give. Um, if you're not sure about sending certain data to the auditor, uh, spend the time and the effort to investigate it first. Um, make sure the data is required um, to fulfil the purpose of the audit. Um, and remember that a, a half correct answer that you give now may expose you to um, deeper scrutiny by, by Microfocus later down the line. So during the verification um, and the, the confirmation phase, um, you should make sure that you check the entire report thoroughly. Um, as you can see from the, the statement at the top here, um, most of the time, if not all the time, there, there will be errors in the audit report. Um, as such, we recommend that you, you don't just look at the summary ELP, um, but you, you take the time to review the underlying data sets for, for all products, um, at least for the software titles that are in red or, or identified as under licensed. Um, you should check the entitlement numbers, uh, the reported usage, and also double check that formulas are used correctly. Um, I've seen many audit reports from both software publishers and big four audit firms. Um, that have typos or, or incorrectly applied formulas. So, so make sure that this is something that you check. Um, you should ask for clarification if you don't understand any part of the report entirely um, and also involve the original person who supplied the auditor with the raw data um, during the data collection process uh, to make sure that the data has not been manipulated or interpreted incorrectly. Um, where possible, try to remove any assumptions that the auditor um, has made in the report due to a lack of data from you, um, as most of these will not be in your favour. Uh, and finally, make sure that any comments and concerns are included in the report. Um, this will strengthen your position when it comes to negotiating with Microfocus. Um, typically, Microfocus will, will forecast a, a sum that they expect from the audit um, and and you know, the, the sooner they know about any kind of concerns that you have or any comments that you have, um, the, the sooner they, they can kind of amend that if needed um, and the easier it is to negotiate. So moving on to the final phase, 
um, microfocus settlements are often punitive um, and they may pursue additional remedies outside of the usual ones, uh, such as suspension of support or termination of existing license agreements. Um, and obviously, as we've already seen, um, they, they do take their, their customers to court sometimes as well. Uh, so um, unsurprisingly, um, according to the, the latest annual report, um, microfocus maintenance revenue had the smallest percentage decline in 2020 compared to license revenue, uh, subscription and subscription as a service revenue um, and consulting revenue. So, so that is kind of mostly where they they make a lot of their money and that's where most of their revenue comes from is from the, the maintenance and, and back maintenance and things like that. Um, but when it comes to the settlements phase with Microfocus, uh, it's important to remember that this is a negotiation um, and Microfocus will initially present a, a kind of worst case scenario to you, um, but there are a few ways to successfully negotiate with them. So whilst it's unlikely um, that Microfocus will, will plainly accept uh, any kind of all excuses, uh, it's certainly worth a try if you have any strong and verifiable reasons for either accidental usage or misdeployment. Um, it's also best practice to try and collaborate with the compliance team uh, rather than being purposefully obstructive. Um, this is more likely to, to land you some publisher goodwill. Um, and, and finally, the negotiation phase is all about give and take. Um, Microfocus compliance teams will want immediate revenue, um, increased future revenue and swift payment, um, all without upsetting you. Uh, so look at what you can afford, um, take any kind of outside factors um, like upcoming quarter or year end into account um, and choose your, your tactic accordingly. So Ben, back over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Poppy. Um, very interesting. So just a quick note here, and I know we've had a couple of questions about this. We, we've actually published a um, software license audit survival guide on our website. It's a downloadable resource that you can go and grab. Um, the process that Poppy has, has described there for Microfocus um, holds, broadly speaking, true to many of the vendors uh, that we work with. And so that is the process that you'll see outlined in this guide and our recommended um, steps of how to respond to each stage. Um, so head over to our websites and uh, go, and, go and get that from the white paper, section, white paper section, if that's something that's of interest to you. Uh, we've got some, yeah, we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, I know we've had one or two in the chat, which Hans has been answering as we go along. Um, Hans, as we, um, just to wait okay. for any more questions to come in. I'll get this this moving definitely, Ben, because I think yeah. one of the interesting things here is we provide a bit of a short introduction because we realize that we can't cover everything that Microfocus does, the history, everything we know. So it's actually quite interesting to see what are the specific concerns people have, how they uh, are you currently in audit, for example, and what stage are you in, what are your experiences? Um, another thing is, you know, have you got specific products where you're wondering about? Um, have you got something else? I see there's also a few hands raised. We can't really see what's going on with the hand raised, but please post your question in the question box. So we're, we're seeing a few coming in, so definitely keep them coming and then we can answer it. So the first one we had, and, and I already answered that in the chat, but let's let's repeat it now is uh, someone asking, what about license terms imposed by Microfocus when performing a product upgrade? Example, when you go from reflection version 14 to 14.1. Um, do you, you know that you have to accept the new license terms as part of that? So we have no experience with that. And one of the big questions you should ask is, who has really you know, agreed to this and what have you agreed to? Um, if it's just where someone installs it and there is a box that says click yes to uh, to install this program, your contract should overrule that because your contract in the end gives you the right to use that software. It doesn't specify which version of the software, it just says you got the right. It's obviously a different thing if Microfocus actually sends you a document 
that where your, your CIO, for example, signed that said, I'm now buying this new version of reflection, because then you, it's going to be much more difficult to claim, hey, some techie agreed to this, you know? So practically the key is who agreed to this? Have they got evidence that you agree to those new terms? And, uh, and then especially, do you agree with their evidence? And that's the basic, but obviously, you know, it, it can be a difficult discussion, but don't be afraid to have it with micro focus. And obviously, if possible, also don't agree to anything that you don't want to agree to, um, but it's difficult to avoid. So I think that was the, the first one that came in. And uh, then the, the second one I've got here is uh, how many years back maintenance is typical in audits for the over deployment? Hello, Poppy, what, what's your experience with that? Uh, so I know that um, the the kind of thing that that Microfocus will will initially claim is is back maintenance um, to the to the time well what they say in their uh, audit clause is is back maintenance to the the time of um, non compliance so um, you know whenever the the period of of non compliance is um, back maintenance so whether that was twelve years ago whether it was two years ago um, it, it will be that long um, it's certainly something that um, is negotiable and, and I've seen negotiated with Microfocus, um, but that is, I think, the wording um, that they have in their in their audit clause. Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's what I've like experienced as well. And and there, one of the key things is when did the non-compliance start? And I think what Microfocus usually does is just assume it was since you know since you purchased the software since history or they just go back as far as possible but there a good counter is definitely trying to evidence either from your end or make microfocus evidence that you were non-compliant two three years ago when they claimed or even more than that so it definitely is is a valid question to double check that the next question I'm seeing here is when reviewing my SAM tool, I'm looking for names of software publishers. Should I search Microfocus and HP or are there a few others I should be looking at? And uh, the, the, the short answer is there's tons. Um, but what, which are the most common terms you look for, Poppy? Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I think there's been around kind of 40 um, acquisitions and, and mergers um, that Microfocus have done. Um, obviously, Microfocus and, and HP are the, the kind of main ones, obviously, Attachmate and um, NetIQ, Noval, anything part of the Attachmate group, um, but also um, things like Borland, um, Serena, uh, NetManage, um, are some of their, their other um, kind of uh, companies that, they, that they've acquired as well. Um, I've seen um, names in kind of software uh, inventory that go back kind of decades um, and names of vendors that were acquired by another vendor before they were then acquired by Microfocus. Um, so so there's certainly um, a lot of kind of publishers to look for. Um, I believe uh, there's a more kind of expansive uh, list in the um, the article that we that we had um, on on Microfocus, I think there's a, a more inclusive list there. Um, but there's there's certainly a lot of names to look for, and and no SAM tool that I've seen um, is fully up to date with all of the, the kind of mergers and acquisitions and the and the publisher names. Um, so it's definitely something that should be looked into, and you shouldn't just focus on on Microfocus um, software. Should you should look at the others as well. Yeah, that article, Poppy, um, if you just Google Fisher ITS Microfocus, or if you go to our news and resources section on the website and search for Microfocus, you'll find an article there that Poppy provided earlier this year. Um, there's a list of various software titles um, to check for. I don't think that's exhaustive, but it's um, it's a it's a pretty long list, isn't it, Poppy? Yeah. Practically, yes. it's, it's very difficult. And yeah, I think someone who is, is saying as well, good SAM tools will auto update publisher name. Absolutely. I think there is still a lot to be questioned there if SAM tools do it for 100%. But it, it could be a good start to, uh, to see if you do that or get an expert, of course, who can recognize these, uh, these articles uh, or these, these new vendor or new specifics. 
um, but especially because the key is, you know, if we say a list now and Microsoft Focus buys a new company in half a year, obviously there would be a new list of vendors to check for. So it will always change, but those are definitely the, uh, the main ones that tend to come up in audits and so on. Um, and the next question, yeah, we got here is to add on to that earlier question is the new software term. Seems like this, uh, this particular listener was uh, involved in an audit and is in a settlement where these new license terms became the big block. And it, it, it's going to be very difficult to say. In this case, apparently the techie clicked yes. There's no signed agreement, but Microfocus is still making the claims. And uh, it can be very difficult to give exact advice because obviously, yeah, in this case, we, we don't know what exactly the term is that they fell over. What's the change with the old agreement? Is it not covered in the old agreement? And so onward. But our usual approach here, and the basic is you already got a number. So Microfocus has seen, they got a fish, they see, all right, this is the, the settlement, the total fee they can ask. So I very rarely, if not never, see a, a vendor like Microfocus drop everything. So at this point, they will stick their heels in, if, especially if this is the only finding, I will say, we want to get something out of it. So the key is just to keep undercutting their arguments up until you get to a point where you uh, where you feel like all right we microfocus doesn't feel secure anymore or there is too much disagreement and they'll drop it enough that you can accept it um, obviously the alternative is go full legal but this is very difficult and in that case we would never advise hey just go full legal check with your own legal people you should have been included at that stage uh, make sure that they're happy to go at it from that that level and, and uh, work at it. But our common argumentation would be, one, we would check what does the new term say? Is it valid, yes or no? Can we technically foundation that request from Microfocus to say they're right, it is a new requirement? Uh, if that is the case and we say, okay, we agree with it, but it wasn't the case before, then you can uh, try the second layer, which is just saying, look, sorry, we do not recognize that agreement. This is the one we signed, which has our director's signature on it. If you have one like that, if you don't, then it becomes a yes, no story, which can make it also more difficult. And just say, look, this is this is the agreement. You know, this, this techie who clicked OK, he does not represent the company. Sorry. So we cannot recognize this as a legally binding agreement because that techie is not a legally re registered signature for the company um, and obviously the key is also then to try and work with with micro focus because they will then get into a yes no argument not going to help anyone so you can then try to work with micro focus to say look all right if this is the new rules we're happy to work by it in the future but let's work together to find uh, a good scenario but it, it's very difficult to get into too much details of this, of course, because there is just yeah so many different scenarios. Um, but just keep in mind, it's a negotiation. Microfocus will drop every single term in their own agreements if it means they can get a bit more money in the short term. So that is usually what they will go at. Um, yeah. And especially, I think their half year is approaching in a few days because I think their half year is uh, end of April. Their uh, year end is, is October. So I think Microfocus will be hard pressed to get any deal to the door today, pretty much to get that uh, in, in those figures. Another question we got is, can we get a copy of this recorded webinar? Ben, I'm pretty sure we're sharing uh, a link with everyone, right? Yes, that it will go out tomorrow. There'll be a, a link to a recording and also we'll uh, publish the slides by PDF as well. So as long as you've registered for this webinar, which clearly everybody here has done, um, it will be sent to your email address. Yeah. All right, cool. And then the next question is, do they always include the audit fees? And if so, what sort of cost have you seen added to the, into the bill? Bobby, have you got any anecdotes there or experiences? Um, in terms of of audit fees, um, I'm, I'm guessing this is uh, the, the the kind of 
general, if the, the non-compliance is over 5%, um, I'm guessing that's that's what um, the question's referring yeah, I to. Think that's, that's the key. And, and one thing to be clear here, that 5%, it's very imaginary, whatever calculation they want to give it, because this 5% <laughs> or 10% or whatever your contract, it's never defined. Yes, um, so this is this is one of the things um, that in a lot of the, the the kind of audit defense projects that I've worked on with kind of against microfocus, it's and and most publishers, um, it is something that is kind of very negotiable. Um, it's usually the first thing that is dropped. Um, as Han said, the kind of calculation um, from what I've seen, it can vary. Um, but but yeah, as I mentioned, it's. It is very negotiable, and, and in most cases, it's it's relatively easy to to kind of drop that part um, during the settlement. Hans, I'm not sure if you've seen anything different. Um, that's what I've seen from my experiences. Absolutely, and I think to give you a rough cost, because the problem is obviously if you're a company of uh, 200 people, the audit cost should be lower than if they're auditing you and you are a multinational, you know. <laughs> top 50 company in the world that is going to be a lot higher so it can be from anywhere from say five thousand pounds up to a hundred thousand pounds or if you want it in dollar you can even say the same amount um so yeah there is definitely a big uh, variation there of what is possible but as poppy said yeah it's usually the first thing they drop because it's easy for them to negotiate out and it's uh it, it seems like a good will for them to drop it See that someone also said, yeah, 5% of license value or a number of licenses. That is the calculation they often do for if they can count it, but still, for example, then what is your number of licenses? Do they count everything you ever purchased or only your active licenses? And that's, that's what I mean with, yes, they usually have their own calculation in-house with are you over 5% or under 5%, but it, it, it doesn't, it's it's always just their made up calculation and they will change it if they feel like they're not reaching it. I've seen that happen too many times where they do that. Or it's also, for example, if you if you only agree to 1% of the findings, do can they still include all these other things that they've claimed are wrong, but you've, you, you've countered. So there's just too many angles to play at to get, is that 5% reached, yes or no? Um, and yeah, the costs, often we see it at, but it's usually the first thing they uh, they drop if it comes down to it. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Poppy. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have for now, isn't it, Hans? I can't see any that, that have gone so around. Yeah, I think that's the main questions I'm yeah. seeing uh, here as well. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, Poppy, just want to move one slide along, please. Um, just wait a second, just in case any other questions come in. But yes, yeah, so yeah, once again, thank you, Poppy. Thank you, Hans, for today's webinar. And thanks very much for joining, um, either at home, if you're working from home, or from an office, wherever you are in the world. Um, if there has been anything today that you would like to speak to Fisher ITS further on regarding Microfocus licensing, or indeed any other vendor that's a particular concern to you at the moment, um, you can see the contact details are on on screen. Uh, love to hear from you, and um, always happy to have that initial um, consultation with you, just to see if uh, there is uh, any help that we can provide, whether that's on audit defence. When it comes to audit defence, um, it is true that the the earlier um, you can set up a, a robust defense the better but there is no time that is too late to engage with a provider when it comes to an audit there is usually always something that can be done to benefit the situation uh, regardless of where you are in the audit process that poppy described earlier um, other than that i think that's where we will uh, wrap up for the day um, i posted a couple of links in the chat to the resources that I mentioned earlier, so please feel free to head over to the website. Um, we regularly publish that kind of content, uh, mainly via our LinkedIn page actually now, so if you go to LinkedIn and search Fisher ITS, you'll find our page there, which is a, a good good source of, of this kind of content for both Microfocus and, and all of the other vendors that we cover. 
Um, okay, we will send this recording out to everybody who registered tomorrow. Um, and yeah, keep an eye out for future Fisher ITS website um, webinars on, on similar topics. Thanks very much. And we'll leave that there.